he, as he's come in and been with us this whole last month, he had a preliminary um, uh, pre-engagement that he's with today. But I am very pleased to introduce to you Paul Cedar. Uh, Paul um, is chair and CEO of Mission America Coalition. Before joining um, the Mission American Coalition, he served as president of the Evangelical Free Church for six years. And uh, for 10 years, he was senior pastor of Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena. And before that, I think he was executive pastor uh, of evangelism at Hollywood Press and has been pastor of a number of evangelical free churches. Um, he's deeply committed to the ministry of evangelism in the United States and around the world and has served as chair of the Luzon uh, Committee for World Evangelism and currently serves as member of the National Prayer Committee and on the board of the U.S. Uh, Center for World Missions. He's authored eight books, the most recent being A Life of Prayer. Paul, can't thank you enough for coming and sharing with us this morning. Thank you, Mike. Blessings. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to all of you for that warm welcome. It's a delight and privilege to be here. You don't know, but uh, we live in Cathedral City, which is... Um, next to Palm Springs, and uh, we drive this way frequently. And uh, Jeannie and I just often pray for you as we go by. Uh, Pastor Gary and Elizabeth uh, became friends during the years that I served as president of the Free Church. Elizabeth actually was giving leadership to uh, our national women's ministry uh, of the denomination. And so uh, we... Uh, we uh, Feel as though we know you. Gary once invited me to, to preach here, so I've been here in years past. I know you all remember exactly the date, exactly, exactly what I spoke about, and you're ready to feed that back. Uh, seriously, uh, it has been um, a great blessing to pray from you, uh, for you from afar, and wonderful to be with you this morning. Uh, we focus this morning on a very, very important subject. The subject uh, that is very dear to God's heart. And as we prepare to do it, if you would turn in your Bibles to the 17th chapter of John. We want to look at this passage together. John 17. I spend some significant time with the Lord every morning as I did this morning, very, very early this morning. And uh, I'm currently... Um, uh, reading through the book of, uh, of Luke. And today's passage focused on the crucifixion of Jesus. And I was reminded again of the centrality of the crucifixion. And we've been reminded so vividly this morning as we've gathered at the communion table and as we've shared together, remembering the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and for the body that it was broken for us. And um, it is very interesting that as, you, um, as we read through the Gospels and we come to the last days of the earthly ministry of Jesus, approximately three years, which he was involved in public ministry, of all the things he could be doing, of all the ways that he could pre be preparing his disciples for what was going to take place, what did he do? He prayed. And he prayed a deep, deep prayer. First for himself. He knew the reason he had come to earth born as a babe in Bethlehem. The reason he came was now very much before him. It was all about the cross. Remember in John 4, when Jesus was with his disciples? in Samaria, and then he continued in John 6. He said, I've not come down from heaven to do my own thing. I've come to do the will of my Father in heaven and to finish his work. Jesus had an assignment. During the years that he ministered, he, he personified for us. He gave us the example of, of what it is to live the life of love and of sacrifice. He, he humbled himself. He, 
emptied himself, as we read in Philippians, and became a servant. He served. And now he was serving by praying, first for himself, that the Father would give him the strength to finish his assignment. That's why he came. Secondly, for the twelve, now eleven, that they would remain faithful. And then thirdly, he prayed for us. He looked through the ages, and he saw his church, and he prayed for us. And this is the prayer. Most of you are familiar with it, but let me read again, and would you follow along from John 17, beginning with verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, that is for the disciples, for the apostles, for the twelve or eleven. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And what is this prayer? That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It is God's intent that we would live lives of oneness, of unity with him and with one another. So, Father, as we study this passage today and other related passages, speak to us as we've just prayed in song. Speak to me, Lord. May we not merely have a person speaking today. Come, we pray, in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit and speak to us. We will then give thanks to your glory in Jesus' name, amen. There's awesome power in spiritual unity. It's God's idea and not our idea. There's a general theme and movement in Scripture that basically where there is God, where there is Jesus Christ, where there is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there is unity. When there is division, when there is bickering, when there is arguing, there is the presence of our enemy. Our enemy loves to divide. Our Lord loves to unify. This was not the introduction of that theme. It begins in the first chapter of Genesis, and it continues throughout Scripture over and over and over again. God grieving when his people would leave him and leave one another, grieving when they were divided, rejoicing when they were united. Turn with me for a moment to a passage most of you know, in Genesis chapter 1, the account of the creation. But notice, if you will, the reference in chapter 1 to spiritual unity. Uh, we begin with verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our, in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now you may be asking the question, what does that have to do with spiritual unity? Well, notice, if you will, the pronoun in which God describes himself 
in creation. God said, let us make man in our image. From the very beginning, it was the work of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John, as most of you know, is introduced by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Who is He talking about but Jesus Christ, present at the creation? Paul in the book of Colossians picks up on that theme and reminds us that all of creation, all was created by Jesus Christ. And that he was not only the creator, he was the purpose of the creator. He's the cosmic glue that holds it all together. We have one of the great doctrines of the church, of the trinity of God. The word Trinity is never used in Scripture, but the teaching is very clear. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the perfect image of unity. Not competitors. Unity. One. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The unity of God. But very quickly, the teaching is expanded in chapter 2 of Genesis. And again, hear the word of the Lord uh, in chapter 2, beginning with verse 23. The man, that is Adam, said, This is now my bone of bones and flesh of flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is the creation of the partner for the man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. I had the privilege of being in the pastorate for about 25 years. I often say 98 years, but it wasn't really that long. It was 25. Um, Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful privilege. I grew up in a pastor's home. I was actually in college before I found out that pastor's children were supposed to be unhappy about it. It was a wonderful, wonderful life. And Jeannie and I love people, and we love to invest in the lives of people. And there's, there's, there's no greater joy than to see people come to faith in Jesus and then grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and grow to become more and more like Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege. One of the things I loved about the pastor at the most were weddings. I love young people and love weddings, love to invest in lives. Not everyone who gets married is young. I understand that. But even at the age of 85, they are young when they get married. <laughs> you notice how they kind of revert to youth when you get married uh, later in life? Uh, I would stand before them, and from time to time in a ceremony, I'd say something like this to the guests. You may not have expected it when you came today, but you are going to see a miracle in our midst. For a little while ago, you saw this, uh, this handsome young man and, and, and his, uh, the party of the groomsmen come, and they're standing here before me and before you, and then you saw this beautiful young lady come down the aisle. And now they're standing. Two people came. One from the left, one down the aisle. And they stand before me now as two people. But in just a moment, an amazing thing is going to take place. In God's sight, and it should be in our sight as well, the two are going to become one for the rest of their lives if they're faithful to one another and to God. Incredible. Marriage is a human example, illustration of the oneness of God. 
Now he's saying the two will become one flesh in his sight. And then later, and we'll speak about this in more detail in a moment, came the church, the one body of Christ. You do not have to be married in order to live in a unity of oneness in Christ. But the illustrations are clear. The unity of God, it is his idea, and the unity of husband and wife. It's a wonderful thing. Now, we don't have time to re review all of the Old Testament and all that it says about unity, but I'd like to return to our text. And um, in John 17, and the whole perspective of what it means to be one, spiritual unity was a high priority of Jesus. Reflected in his prayer, and we review it now for just a few moments, that all of them may be one Father, I pray for them, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. What a definition. If we don't understand what it means to be one, he gives us the illustration. And what an illustration, an impossibility that we would become one in the body of Christ as he and the Father are one. That was his prayer, and that is his desire. And then he went on and said, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. Oh, that is the key. We will never be one in the way God intends until we are one in Christ, one in Him. One in the Father, one in the Son, one in the Holy Spirit. That the world may believe you have sent me. When a church is in unity, or when a marriage is in unity, or when a family is in unity, we may not even realize it. It is an incredible witness to those around us. It brings credibility to the gospel, credibility to what God is all about, credibility to the gift of his son, that God so loved the world that he would give his son, that whoever would believe in him would never perish but have life eternal. Incredible. God's idea not ours, but let us read on. I've given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. The key is Christ in us, Paul later wrote, the hope of glory, in Christ, in the Father, and in unity, and with the Holy Spirit as well. All one, living in unity together. But then he went on, and he made it even more explicit, and he, even more challenging. That they may be brought to complete unity. This is not an option, friends. This is God's desire. We do not have an audio or video recording of Jesus praying this prayer. But in looking at the context and understanding that the cross was just before him, just preparing to sacrifice his life, and that a short time later he would be praying in agony in the garden, and crying out to his father, saying, Father, if it's possible, can we go to plan B? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Can you sense the sincerity of his prayer as he's praying for us? Can you sense that he really wanted this to happen? 
Can you sense the depth of his crying out to his father, Oh, Father, may they be one as we are one. May they be brought to complete unity as I live in them and you live in me and we live in relationship with one another. Unity, spiritual unity. By the way, I'm doing the clicking here, so if things are not coming up, you know who to blame. You've got great people back there. You've got a guy that gets um, sidetracked here when I come along. It is a wonderful way to live, and it's God's way. Now, I want you to know, when Jesus was praying that day, his disciples were not very unified. In fact, it's very interesting. There's one word in the gospel, Gospels you never find describing the disciples except when they were in a room together or they, they were together. That is the word together. They were not really together. They argued. They really believed Jesus was the Messiah. They had... They had given up a lot to follow him, and they really believed that he was going to establish his kingdom on earth. He was going to overthrow Caesar, overthrow Herod, and they were going to become VIPs. Very important people. And they were going to sit at his right and left. And so what did they argue about? Who's going to sit on his right? Who's going to sit on his left? James and John had their, their little Jewish mother come and lobby for them one day, remember? She basically said, Jesus, you know my sons are the best. So I'll leave the big question up to you. Which one's going to sit at your right and which one's going to sit at your left? Thank you. Jesus didn't answer her. He looked right at the sons and he said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Can you drink my cup? Oh, yes, we can drink your cup. They saw the power and the glory. They didn't see the cross and the suffering, the persecution. So many brothers and sisters around the world being persecuted fiercely today. Did you hear about the beheading of children in the last few days by ISIS? Inconceivable all because the parents would not reject Jesus. Only reason. But Jesus said, in my kingdom, it's not like the Gentiles. It's not like those who lord over you. In my kingdom, the greatest is the servant. The one who serves. Spiritual unity won't work without that mentality. In a competitive culture in which we live, we need to humble ourselves. And then we can come together. Turn over a few pages to the book of Acts. And we're going to explore this togetherness for just a few moments. I want for us to understand today that spiritual unity was the practice of the early church from the very beginning. That Jesus said to his disciple in Acts 1.8, many of you have memorized, all of you are familiar, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Notice Acts chapter 1. In verse 14. They all join together constantly in prayer. That's what Jesus told them to do when he ascended to the Father, and they did it. And they were together. There was this little band of about 120 people. 
And they prayed. I don't think they even fully understood what they were praying for. I don't think they understood this gift of the Holy Spirit that was going to be coming to them. But they prayed. It's good for us to come together to pray. In fact, it's very, very important. I know people say, well, I pray. I don't need to pray with anyone else. I prayed early this morning for some significant time, and so did many of you. And you're going to pray during the day, and we should live the lives of prayer, and that should be a part of our lifestyle. But friends, there's something very special when we come together to pray. And as the church is going through this important transition of a wonderful pastor who's, and his wife who served you for so many years and are so deeply loved, it's important that we gather together and pray. I would encourage you, I'm your guest today. I would encourage you, gather together in your small groups, in your classes, in any way. Gather together as a congregation. Follow the pattern of the early church. Come together. If you want your hearts to be together, if you want your minds to be together, then begin by praying together, seeking God, asking for his will, not yours, giving up your will, even your ideas, even your great suggestions to humble ourselves, to pray, and to seek his face. Chapter 2, you know it so well, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And that day, the church was born out of a prayer meeting. Many people are surprised to hear the church was not begun by a committee. But it wasn't. Supernaturally born of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly the vocabulary changed. And now you see repeated over and over and over again in the book of Acts, the word together. They were together. Look, if you will, a little further down in the chapter. They devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, of what we have done this morning, and to prayer. What were their priorities? Two of them were vertical. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the teaching of the scriptures, the word of God. And they gave themselves to prayer. Our lives are never what God wants them to do unless we are devoted to those two activities in our lives. And then they devote themselves, and isn't this strange, of all the things they could have done, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which, of course, was the formal communion service following and obeying Christ. But also, as we read later on, they were all the believers were together. Verse 44, they had everything in common. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, as we're doing today, meeting together. And they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. They were not lone rangers. They were not living in silos. They were together. I love the New English Bible translation that says they, they, they shared meals from house to house with unaffected joy. Have you noticed so often when Christians come together, they eat? It's not a bad idea. It's a great biblical foundation for that. We do it together. We all know that in Acts, the first two chapters describe the birth of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the changing of lives. Remember, Jesus had said to his disciples in John 14 and 15 and 16, one day he said to them, and this is a paraphrase, guys, it's good for you. that I'm going away. 
Can you believe it? He's telling him, I'm going to leave you and it's going to be good for you. And then he explained why. It was because of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he basically, if I can summarize, he basically was saying, guys, I will no longer live with you. I will now live in you, in the person, in the power of the Holy Spirit. You will have power you've never had before. You can do things you've never done that you can't do in your own strength. Any Christian who's living in their own strength is like sitting in a, in a brand new Mercedes and never turning on the engine. Friends, God has given us himself to dwell in us. And Jesus was saying, I will no longer minister with you. I will now minister through you. And that's what he did. But the first two chapters describe the birth of the church. And notice what the next two chapters are. They're about the first crisis the church faced. And the first crisis was Peter and John going to the temple for prayer with the other believers. They did it every day. And walking up and seeing a man who had been lame from birth, and he asked for a donation, and Jesus, or Peter basically checked out his pockets, and he said, I'm sorry, friend, silver or gold I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he did. And he didn't just walk. The text says he was jumping for joy. My Swedish grandfather would have said he, he was jumping with the joy of the Lord. And people came running from everywhere. And they were praising God until the religious establishment got involved. And they say, you can't do that. So they put him in jail. And overnight, and the next day, they went before the Sanhedrin. And they, 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 they were put on trial. And they said, how did you do this? And we said, you thought, Peter said, you thought you got rid of Jesus, but you didn't. We did this in the name of Jesus. We didn't heal this man. Jesus did. And they said, you will never use that name again. Do never speak about Jesus again in public. And you remember Peter said, we can't help but talk about Jesus. There's no other name given under heaven and earth whereby we must be saved. We've got to talk about Jesus. And then they were sternly, sternly warned and thrown out. Now they faced a decision. Their lives were in jeopardy. They knew those were not idle threats. They remembered what this same group of people had done with Jesus shortly before. And now they had a problem. What did they do? Did they head back to Galilee to go fishing, to take a sabbatical, to take vacation? Did they back off? No, they went to the church. And what did they do when they got to the church? They prayed. And in Acts chapter 4, we won't take time to read it, but in Acts chapter 4, the scripture says, they raised their voices together in one accord. The power of a church when it is praying in one accord, there's no greater power in the face of the earth than a church who is praying in one accord. Their prayer was interesting. They didn't pray the way I would pray at that moment. They didn't pray, Lord, deliver us, protect us. They said, Lord, give us courage to speak the name of Jesus. We realize it's risky. We realize we're putting our lives on the line. But give us, give us power to do that. And he did. It was incredible. 
Notice if you read in Acts chapter 4 after all this had happened. Verse 32. I've got my Bible marked. That's why I'm hesitating. I can't read the verse number. All the believers were one in heart and mind. That's what comes when we pray together. One body. Jesus Christ the head. We members of his body. All in one accord. What's our responsibility in this? Turn, if you will, as we come to conclusion, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. A wonderful passage, again, that is so familiar to us. Beginning with verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be, be, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, loving with one another. This is a description of spiritual unity, how we come together. We must humble ourselves. We must love one another with the love of Jesus Christ. We must be patient with one another. Doesn't this sound a lot, those of you married with children, about what we need to keep working at in our homes, in our families? And then he goes on. Make every effort to keep or to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. To preserve it. The basic assumption is here, the church is united. Make every effort to keep it that way. Every one of us, as individuals, have a responsibility. Have you ever noticed, in a marriage or in a family, just one person could break the unity? Have you ever noticed, in a church... Although this is a large congregation, but even in a small church, a large church, one person or a little group of people can absolutely fracture the unity of the body. And so as we come to the table to examine ourselves, Jesus said, never come to this table without examining yourself. As we come to this subject, we need to examine ourselves and say, Lord, Lord, Am I causing disunity in any way? What should I be doing to maintain, to strengthen, to keep the unity of the body of Christ? It becomes very, very personal for you and for me. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I love that passage. What a picture of the church as God intends it to be. Later on in this chapter, Paul, in, in, uh, uh, in Ephesians 4, Paul speaks about every member of the body working properly. It falls on us. So one closing text, if I may. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, and I would add sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so there may be no divisions among you, 
and that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. That, my dear brothers and sisters, as your guests today, that is my prayer for you and for this great church. Wonderful days lie ahead if we draw near to God and draw near to each other in the unity that only he can supply. I cannot legislate unity, nor can your elders, nor can any of you. It must be an authentic work of the Holy Spirit in lives that are submitted to him. So that is our prayer, dear Lord. First of all, for our own lives. Lord, would we ask you to examine our lives right now in the closing of this service? Am I right with you? Am I right with my brothers and sisters? Am I contributing to the unity of the body of Christ? And Lord, we pray that you may guide us by the Holy Spirit. You may provide for us. You may direct us to the praise and honor and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord and the Lord of the church, the head of the body of Christ. For we pray in his precious and his holy name. Amen and amen.